about it, because you've got to explain to us what black hole astrophysics has to do with exoplanet satellites. <coughs> this should be pretty fun and interesting. So, yeah, thanks, Louis. Um, yeah, so I actually realized this morning I'm wearing both orange and maroon, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so, so I, uh, I work primarily on studying uh, AGN, which are active supermassive black holes, uh, centers of galaxies. Um, and uh, and some and you know all all galaxies have poly supermassive black hole at the center. All large galaxies do, but about 10% of those have a black hole that is actively accreting matter from a, a disk, an accretion disk of, of dust and gas. So here is kind of the geometry, just so you have a picture as we move forward today. Uh, the black holes at the center there. The matter falls in, loses angular momentum, and forms this disk, an accretion disk. Um, that's surrounded by this kind of donut-shaped object called the dusty torus. And that means that from some viewing angles, you aren't able to see the accretion disk. Um, so they look like different objects from our point of view. And in about 10% of these type of objects, uh, there is a relativistic jet that is launched from the proximity of the black hole. Might be because the black hole is feeding off of the rotation of the disk, or the, rotation, or the jet is feeding off the rotation of the disk, or the rotation of the black hole itself. Um, there's a large zoo of different classifications of AGN. Some that depend on viewing angles, some depend on um, power of the, of, the, uh, of the radiations of the total luminosity, and a lot of it has to do with the accretion rate, or how much matter is accreting onto the supermassive black hole. However, uh, all those different types of AGN have one thing in common generally, and that's that they're uh, variable. So this is a plot called a light curve. Um, it's a plot of brightness over time. This is a historical plot from 1963 of a quasar, uh, 3C273. Uh, again, that's kind of the, the type of this data, it's called a light curve. Um, and you can see the variability. This is a baseline of about five, uh, 300 days. Uh, and the brightness goes up and down in kind of a stochastic pattern. You're not seeing a lot of, there's no periodicity there. Um, and this is important because these optical light curves are one of the only direct probes of conditions uh, within the accretion disk. And the reason for that is that this disk, while large on human size scales is quite small astrophysically. So if you had the black hole at the position of the sun, the accretion disk would be about the size of the solar system. But if you take that and you put it in the center of a galaxy, and then you take that galaxy and put it really far away, we can't resolve that object with most of our telescopes. I have to say most now because of the event horizon telescope, so we'll probably see one. Um, <laughs> um, or two. Two flows, one disk. Um, but we are quite sure that the emission, the optical and ultraviolet emission from AGN comes from the accretion disk. So watching that emission vary with time tells us about the behavior in the disk, which is magnetized, turbulent, and an energetic object. So it's very dynamic. Now it's not only optical data that shows this kind of variability. This is a radio light curve at 22 gigahertz, and the baseline there is like 30 years or something. Um, and this is a gamma ray light curve from Fermi. Uh, and so we really see this variability in, in almost, well, in every wave band that we've looked at um, at supermassive black holes. So uh, you'll notice, though, uh, if you look at the optical light curve and compare it to the gamma ray light curve, you'll see that there's holes in the light curve. There's large spaces of time where no data was collected. Um, and that makes sense because it's a telescope on the ground. You can't observe during the day. You can't observe during certain times of the year because the object is up during the day, and you can't observe during the weather, and there's people climbing over you to use the telescope uh, also. So, um, so there's ground-based sampling, you know, has all these gaps and these issues, but you'll notice the gamma ray light curve does not have these problems. It's uh, quite evenly sampled for the entire time. So wouldn't it be fabulous if we could take optical light curves where we can study the accretion disk, the gamma ray and radio emission does not come from the accretion disk. Um, if we could study the accretion disk, uh, using data that looks like that gamma ray light curve. And that has become possible now uh, because other people have gotten very interested in looking in the time domain <clears throat> in the optical from space for other reasons. So this is a Kepler spacecraft. It was launched in 2009 uh, by NASA to look for the signal from transiting exoplanets. So it looks for the dip in the light of a star when the planet passes in front of its face, and that's a periodic signal. Um, and it requires extreme precision to do this well, because it's a tiny signal. Like if the planet blocks, there's a little minuscule amount of light from the star when it passes in front of it. So the photometric precision of this instrument is totally unprecedented. It's the best photometer we've ever launched by far. Um, 
And the way that it did this was it looked at one part of the sky for four years and it didn't move. So you couldn't point to the Kepler telescope. Um, and it just watched, and every 30 minutes it took a data point. So the light curves are four years long with the data point every 30 minutes. Um, and it did that with extreme precision to look for these, these planets. So this is a picture of that field of view. Uh, that's the shape of the Kepler field of view where it pointed for four years. And you'll notice that it's quite close to the Milky Way uh, in our sky. Now they did that because they're looking for planets in our galaxy, of course. Um, and they couldn't go into the plane because it's too crowded. So they look for planets in this field. Um, it was spectacularly successful. This is a, just a plot of planet mass versus orbital period for the planets we knew of uh, before we launched Kepler with uh, nice horizontal reference points for our solar system friends. And this is after. Um, so Kepler really blew it up in terms of Earth-like exoplanets uh, and you know, many other types as well. So this instrument was fabulously useful and did its job marvelously. But a lot of the things that made it really good at this make it very difficult to use it for uh, AGN science. And the very first one is that field of view. So because they picked a field of view that was quite close to the galactic plane, that meant it didn't overlap with our big extragalactic surveys like Sloan. Uh, so there were almost no AGN known in the Kepler field of view. There were two. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is find them. Uh, it turns out the type of AGN you find depends quite sensitively on how you look for them. Uh, so there is a great class of objects with one of the better acronyms to come out of astronomy, um, X-Bong. And it's not even that contrived because it actually is the first letter of each word. Um, so there's no little short letters in there making hot dogs or green beans or whatever they are these days. Um, but uh, these objects look like normal galaxies in every wavelength except x-rays. So this is just a plot from some work from 2014 where we took uh, eight of these and looked and tried a whole bunch of different selection methods to try to find the AGN in the middle. And it turns out that um, x-ray detection is the only way to recover all eight of them. Um, and they look optically normal for a lot of different reasons. Some of them are obscured. Some of them are so far away that the galaxy light dominates the spectrum. Uh, but anyway, x-rays finds majority of them. And this plot is just histograms of the volumetric luminosity, the black hole mass, and the Eddington ratio or accretion rate, essentially, um, that you recover <coughs> using these three different selection methods, radio, uh, infrared, and x-ray. And the green is the x-ray. And the, the point of the plot here is just to show you that x-ray selection recovers the broadest parameter space in black hole mass and accretion rate and total power. Uh, so it's a very good way to find AGN. So we did this. Um, the, uh, this is the Kepler field of view. You'll recognize that funny shape. Those red modules are the ones that we surveyed with the Swift X-ray telescope to look for AGN. The plot underneath is just a diagram of the Swift pointings. Uh, and then once we had an X-ray source, we had to decide whether or not it was an AGN because there could be a true bright star. There can be a lot of other things. So we had to go and follow those up with optical spectra. Some of them were stars and some of them had these broad emission lines uh, that we associate with AGN. So we got 40 new AGN out of this survey uh, in the Kepler field of view. And then we can ask Kepler to monitor them. Now this lovely slide represents probably three years of my thesis, but it's the most boring part, so it's only one slide. Um, so uh, the data from Kepler are extremely challenging for a lot of reasons, and this slide will just, uh, you know, I'll just talk briefly about it, but um, the uh, signal that Kepler was designed to detect is a periodic variability in a point source. So a dot that gets dimmer with a very predictable pattern. AGN variability is the exact opposite of this. The variability is stochastic, as you saw in that light curve I showed you. It's non-periodic, uh, and it's in extended sources. So these live in galaxies. So putting a little tiny aperture around the star and looking for the, the dip, it doesn't work. One reason it doesn't work is because the galaxy T, uh, extends outside the aperture, and as the spacecraft drifts, the aperture moves, and if the galaxy moves out of the aperture, the light curve goes down, but it's not because the AGN is varying, it's because the spacecraft moves. So there's a lot of very difficult systematics to remove here. But if you're willing to put up with that, or if you're a graduate student and you have to do it because it's your, <laughs> it's your project, um, the result is beautiful. Um, so these are three representative Kepler AGN light curves. 
Um, the baseline here is in days. This is 1,200, uh, 300, and 800, or 9, uh, 600, sorry, 1,200, 600, and 800. Um, and, uh, Again, those are data points every half hour. And I show these three because they're good examples of the types of variability. So we have objects like the one on the top that uh, are stochastically varying the whole time. Objects like the one in the middle, which hang out and don't look like they're variable for a long time. And then something happens. I don't know what that is. Um, and then there's things like the bottom one where there's a superposition of both. So you have stochasticity, but also these discrete events that might indicate a large mass accretion rate variations, for example. So once you have data like this, um, you can actually create power spectra very easily. So the power spectrum is just the square of the Fourier transform of the light curve. Um, and what it tells you, uh, these are three power spectra of, this, of the objects I just showed you. Power spectrum is a plot of the uh, power in the variability at a given spectroscopic or at a, at a given temporal frequency. So how much power is in that variability of the light curve at a given kind of time scale. Uh, and anyway, just to make this less prosaic, there's basically two observables that, uh, that we looked at uh, for the Kepler light curves. One is the slope of the high frequency part of the power spectrum, which I won't get into in this talk. And the other is the break frequency, which is at what point the power spectrum uh, turns over and is no longer well modeled by a single power law. And that frequency corresponds to a time scale, which we refer to as the characteristic time scale of variability. That could be the uh, orbital time scale of the disk. It could be um, the viscous time scale or the thermal time scale. Uh, but all of those time scales should scale with mass, basically because they depend on the dimensions of the accretion disk. Uh, so there's only uh, five objects in the Kepler sample that showed this signal. Uh, so it's not a correlation, but it's a sanity check uh, because it turns out that the characteristic time scales that we found do scale with mass in a sensible way. So the mass, you know, these are spectroscopic masses measured from the widths of the broad lines. So, okay, that's fun, um, but you know, I'll talk a little bit later about tests and how we're going to do this on a much larger scale, uh, but it's nice to see that the characteristic time scales are correlating with mass in a way that sort of makes sense qualitatively. But more fun than that are quasi-periodic oscillations. So this is also a power spectrum. Um, this is a power spectrum of a stellar mass black hole in the X-ray. Uh, so same, same idea, the power of the variability at a given time scale. But you'll see that un, unlike the Kepler uh, power spectra, there's a huge peak in this one. And that means that there is a periodicity. Now, of course, a perfect period would be a delta function. Uh, but this is a quasi-period. So it's kind of fat, it's kind of fuzzy, and it also can disappear um, in the power spectrum. So these are actually pretty common in the X-ray light curves of stellar mass black holes like X-ray binaries. We see them in most of the objects that we look for them in. Um, it was recognized about 15, yeah, 15 years ago um, that there is a correlation between the frequency of the uh, oscillation and the black hole mass. Now, this is old, but it's gotten better since then. Uh, and so this is pretty well established. So this is telling us that this behavior, this periodic behavior, uh, is coming from quite close to the black hole, depends on the black hole in a sensitive way. Um, now, if accretion behaves in a self-similar manner from uh, stellar mass black holes all the way up to supermassive black holes, we would expect to see these in supermassive black holes too. Why not? It comes from the disk. We know they have disks. Um, and so uh, they have been very frustratingly difficult to find. Uh, in 2008, the first convincing QPO in an, in an X-ray light curve of an AGN was found. Uh, there's the light curve over there. Here's the power spectrum. There's the peak. Um, and, uh, and this was uh, the very first X-ray QPO that was seen in a light curve. Light curves like that are not easy to get for AGN. Uh, that's a lot of time on XMM. And, uh, and there's just not that many objects with these kinds of light curves. So we've found, not we, but we as humans have found a uh, handful of X-ray AGN QPOs, like four, six, two. It depends on who you talk to and how many they believe. Um, but the question that I have to ask then is, are we not finding them because they don't exist and the AGN don't have QPOs for some reason? Or do we just not have the data sets to enable us to see this kind of signal for AGN? Because the time scales we're talking about for the stellar mass black holes are like milliseconds or tenths of a second. And so you don't need a long light curve to see that signal, right? You can just point the telescope for some relatively short baseline and, and take it out. 
But for AGN, the time scales are very long, uh, to, you know, several days to months. And so you would need a, a light curve that spanned a very long time with very good sampling, and that just doesn't exist in the X-ray for a large number of targets. But it does exist with Kepler, and so we have a candidate uh, for a quasi-periodic oscillation with Kepler. This would also be the first optical QPO um, that had been seen. Uh, because the, the disk of the X-ray binaries doesn't emit in the optical, or not much. Um, so this is the power spectrum of that target. You can see that it's fit relatively well by a single power law plus a Lorentzian component, which is the orange. Um, and if you now take the correlation between frequency and mass that I showed earlier, and these three guys up here, those are the ones I showed in the kind of curvy plot you saw earlier, um, and then blow it up to be all the way out to supermassive black holes, all of these are X-ray detections. Um, these are the AGN over here. There's two types of QPO. I didn't want to have time to go into that, but there's low and high frequency QPOs. Uh, and if you take the, uh, the relationship between frequency and mass through the stellar mass black holes, this intermediate mass guy, um, and the only AGN with a low frequency QPO is detected, and you fit that line, and then you put the Kepler point on it, it's like, that's the Kepler point. So it's very nice that it lands right there. It's not part of the fit. Um, and uh, that's why I actually kind of believe it, because it's also very easy to be fooled to think you see a periodicity in these kind of stochastic variability light curves, because sometimes they go up and down for a little while, and it looks like a periodicity, but it turns out if you watch longer, it disappears. Um, so this object now, we're actually monitoring it um, with NICER, which is an X-ray timing instrument on the ISS, um, to look for two things. To look and see if we see the same period in the X-ray, or if we see the high-frequency counterpart. So a lot of these objects show both. Um, a lot of the stellar mass black holes, I should say, show both high and low frequency. So we're going to look for that. So um, you know, those results will hopefully be coming out uh, relatively soon, because we're on month eight of that monitoring. Um, but that's the Kepler stuff, so let me move into the future here and hopefully get people excited about TESS, uh, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. This is a picture of it here. Um, it's about the size of a washing machine without the solar panels, so it's a modest instrument. Um, and it is the successor to Kepler in a lot of ways. Uh, so it has the same uh, photometric precision. The limiting magnitude is a little brighter. Um, and uh, it has the same monitoring, so same 30 minutes. Uh, but it has, you know, it, it, these objects are totally underused for high-energy astrophysics. They really should be used because they're totally unprecedented in terms of their precision and optical timing. Uh, but it has one major advantage over Kepler, and that's the um, sky coverage. So remember, Kepler's like one little field of view. Uh, TESS is very different. So it has four cameras. That's those little boxy things in the opening. And they're aligned such that they, uh, the fields of view of the cameras are one on top of the other, like in the blue picture. And what TESS is doing, this picture is upside down, but I guess there's no up and down in space. But it's doing the southern hemisphere first. But it, it's doing one wedge of those blue things, and then it's doing the next, it's for 27 days, then the next one for 27 days, and the next one for 27 days. Uh, and the result of that is that at the pole, you have overlap, so you have a full year of monitoring. And then the, the time baseline depends on your position in the wedge for the rest of it. Uh, but it's going to be the southern hemisphere for a year and the northern hemisphere for a year. And so the number of AGN light curves that will come out of this is humongous compared to what we were able to find in the Kepler field, not the least because we already know where millions of AGN are uh, in the sky. So, so we can skip that whole first step. Uh, so what are we going to do? So I'm going to talk about four uh, kind of a short short mode of four different things, I think there's four, uh, that I'm going to do with the, with tests here and with a bunch of collaborators, of course. Um, so the first is to uh, look at blazars. So this is the same kind of picture I started to talk out with, but now it's at a different orientation. If you look down the jet, uh, if, you're, or if it's a rare orientation, but if there's a line such that we're looking down the jet, um, the optical emission and variability no longer comes from the disk. It comes from detailed processes within the jet itself. And one reason that we can see those detailed processes is because as the jet is coming towards us, uh, its emission is Doppler boosted because it's relativistic. So even small variations in the behavior of the jet are detectable thresholds of this behavior. So uh, this is a spectral energy distribution of such an object. 
uh, very broad, so it goes from radio all the way to gamma rays. And uh, this kind of camel hump shape is characteristic of blazars. There's a low energy peak and a high energy peak. Um, the origin of the low energy peak is pretty well modeled by synchrotron emission from the jet itself. The whole, so from, from uh, radio to optical, it's pretty well understood, well modeled by synchrotron emissions. But the origin of the high energy peak is unknown. Uh, and there's a couple of leading models that I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, but one thing that uh, we're doing is to get simultaneous uh, radio with the Korean VLBI network, um, optical with TESS, UV and X-ray with SWIFT, and gamma ray with Fermi of blazars that are within that um, year-long monitoring radius for TESS. Um, I don't have time to go into all the implications here, uh, but the, the uh, kind of all those lights at the same time, like whether we see a flare in the radio and then in the X-ray or, or optical and vice versa, can tell us about the location of flaring activity within the jet. Um, we can look for periodicity to potentially see um, candidates for binary supermassive black holes, which I'll address in a minute. Um, and uh, look at the origin of that high energy peak or the high energy emission. So that SWIFT program is ongoing. Um, and to get to just kind of flush, flush out that middle data point, um, uh, like I said, the, uh, the, the low energy peak is well modeled by synchrotron. So one model for the high energy peak called a leptonic model is that the same electrons that are producing the synchrotron emission in the low energy peak are either scattering the synchrotron photons, or synchrotron self-compton, up to high energies, or they're scattering photons from the torus. This is the same diagram of the form, it's cartoon now from the thesis. Uh, the torus, uh, the disk, or even the C and B. So those same photons are kind of upscattering things to Compton, or Compton upscattering things to the gamma rays. The other model is hadronic, which means that in addition to the accelerated electrons, the protons have been accelerated to very high energy. They exceed the photopion production threshold, uh, and the pions that are produced in that then decay, producing gamma rays and also neutrinos. So people kind of, and, and there's always, you know, there's probably a combination of these two models uh, going on in some objects. So uh, these are contentious. There's like a huge number of references that I couldn't even fit that are trying to determine the difference here. Um, but the recent detection of a neutrino from a blazar, which is very much in the news, uh, might lead uh, some credence to the hadronic model just because neutrinos are also a decaying product of the pions. So exciting that we are now seeing neutrinos from blazars. Maybe there will be more. Um, so blazars are the first thing I want to look at with TESS. Um, the next is a really cool subject that I've been interested in for a really long time, um, binary supermassive black holes. So these beautiful pictures from Hubble are galaxy mergers. If we think that every large galaxy has a black hole at its center, and we think that most large galaxies have undergone some sort of merger event, and we certainly know mergers happen, not just from images like these, but because we see them in our simulations that result in a universe that looks like the one we see today, um, then it stands to reason that there should be a large number of binary supermassive black holes in the middle of the skies. But they have been frustratingly difficult to find. Um, that's an artist's conception of what it might look like down in the middle. Uh, the first and most obvious thing to do is to just look for them in pictures, um, to take a high resolution image and see if you see two cores in, for example, X-ray or radio. Um, this is really inefficient, mainly because you have to know where, where to look. Uh, you can't do that for every existing galaxy or merger remnant. Uh, so you do find some, uh, but man, it takes forever. And it, you don't actually get an accurate idea of the fraction because you're pre-selecting to look at places where you think they might be. Um, another way to possibly do this, you remember the AGN spectrum I showed at the beginning that had these emission lines? Uh, if you have two, you could conceive that there would be two emission line systems very close to each other, but they would be separated in velocity space because one's moving towards you and one's moving away from you. Um, so that results in a double peaked line. I used to spend some time looking for this, and it's also inefficient as it turns out, uh, because we found a lot of them, but that uh, signal, the double peaked line, is actually degenerate with several other descriptions of uh, several other physical uh, arrangements that can cause it. So. Uh, biconical outflow, you also have uh, a ionized component moving towards you and an ionized component moving away from you. So you still get a split. A rotating disk gives you the same thing. So turns out that doesn't really work that well either. People like it for outflows, uh, but it doesn't work so well for binaries. So what would be an, a totally non-degenerate signal would be perhaps periodicity. 
So there are people who are looking for periodic uh, behavior in AGN light curves. Um, this is just a couple. These are ground-based light curves, so you see the gaps. Um, now, there's a couple different models for, for why binaries would create periodicity. It seems obvious when you're just thinking about it, but it's not. It's actually a slightly more subtle. Uh, one is uh, gravitational self-lensing. So you have two black holes with accretion disks, and when one moves behind the other, this one actually gravitationally lenses the light from the accretion disk of this one, and so that happens periodically. Another is that when these, black, when these binaries form, they actually kind of carve a hole out of the center of the circumbinary disk. So you have a huge disk, and then you have a hole, and then you have the two black holes. And those black holes are fed by streamers from the edge of the circumbinary disk hole. And when the orbit occurs, uh, the streamers actually collide and shock each other. So there's a lot of models for, how this, for why this can happen, but here's some people that are looking for them. Um, there's many candidates from ground-based surveys like PANSTAR, the transient factories, and of course LSST, which is a huge time domain survey that's coming up in a couple of years, but we'll have lots of graphics like curves that look like these. Um, but uh, if you just look, you know, for example, at this one, you'll realize that this is actually kind of a risky game because, um, because that behavior, if you just watched a little bit longer, could stay flat, it could go down, it, that could just be a short excerpt. Like think about that light curve at the top that I showed you before. You could cut out a piece of that and definitely see a sinusoid, right? So it's very dangerous with what we call red noise dominated data or this kind of variability to claim that you have a periodicity. Um, but tests can help us with this, and, and the Kepler light curves too, although there's a small sample there, uh, because it gives us the true behavior. So one thing that uh, you can do with these space-based light curves is downsample them and introduce errors to make them look like this, and then run these, these period searching algorithms, and if you find 50% of the light curves are periodic, you know that's a false positive rate because they're not in the true behavior that you see in the Kepler data. It just looks like it if you take that sampling rate down. So it's useful to help constrain uh, the kinds of false, false positives that you get uh, from using ground-based data. Now, the reason I, I'm saying we're not looking for periodicities of this nature in the test data is because the baselines are too short. So these are like several year periodicities and the baseline for tests, the maximum is one year. Uh, but this self-lensing is a different, uh, a different uh, issue. So Dan DiRazio is another Einstein fellow, and the Einstein Fellowship has this thing where every October we all come together and give talks about our research to each other. Um, and it turns out to be useful because I saw his, his uh, theoretical work on the self-lensing model. So you can ignore most of the numbers here, but the idea, this is what I was showing you before, is um, a black hole with an accretion disk orbiting another black hole. And at certain geometries, this is supposed to be the maximum, um, the, uh, the Einstein radius is such that it boosts the emission from gravitational lensing at a certain point in the orbit from when the accretion disk passes behind it. And this theoretical signal looks like this. So there's the lensing of the primary, and then there's another mini lens. I think that primary black hole is not accreting in his model. Um, and then there's kind of the Doppler curve in the background just from the orbital motion. So when I saw this at, during his talk at the, um, yeah, what's well, called periodic self um, when I saw this at, during his talk at the Einstein Symposium, I got really excited because I have this in the Kepler data. And I had no idea what this was. Like, I don't know. I, I, looked, I was very paranoid about this flare. Like, I looked all the stars nearby. Uh, there was this issue where, like, the ghost image of Mars, like, from way over here, like, caused an issue on the CCD over here. Like, I was very worried about all this stuff. But, I could not get rid of it. I could not figure out any reason to throw those data points out uh, and any systematics that would cause it. And so what is it? I don't have any idea and I just put it in the paper so I don't know what it is. And then when I saw his plot, I was like, hey, that looks kind of like your theoretical signal. So after some modeling, um, this is actually the model that best fits the data and the green flash is still back there behind it. Uh, so. It does fit a self-lensing model, and it fits it well with, uh, so we don't know the mass of both black holes, but we can get the mass of one of them uh, from the optical spectrum, which is uh, 10 to the 8.17, and that's one of the masses here. The mass ratio is a free parameter. The accretion, the, the size of the disk is a free parameter, so there's some error here. The great thing, though, 
is that it, it should happen again. <laughs> so we'll know if we're right, and that should happen in 2020. Um, so we're going to watch. Um, we have swift time to watch for this within a certain window around when it should happen. Uh, and then the test data will exist, and the ground-based survey data will exist. So if it happens again, then woohoo! That's one of the great things about periodic candidates is you can, you're going to know whether you're right. So of course, finding binary uh, black holes is a, uh, a relevant thing to do these days. So back in 2010, when I was actually it was my uh, 2009, I guess it was my very first AAS. I brought up those uh, double peaked uh, emission lines candidates for black hole binaries, and uh, all these people came by my poster and they were like, "What's the point?" And I was like, "Well, Lisa." And then everyone was like, "Well, that's never going to happen." And it was a huge bummer because I thought I, you know, was getting shot down on this incredible instrument that could maybe put some constraints on this, but it is going to happen. And it's going to happen because of LIGO, basically. Um, <laughs> but we know gravitational waves exist now. Um, and we know that they observe black hole mergers. Uh, but uh, LIGO can't see supermassive black hole mergers because the wavelengths are so long um, that the, the, the you know, baseline between the lasers are not long enough on the Earth to see it. So LISA is, to, is basically LIGO in space millions of kilometers between the, the, uh, the mirrors and the lasers uh, along them. So that's one idea. The other uh, thing that's happening now is pulsar timing arrays, which is amazing. It's one of the cleverest things that people have come up with in a long time, astronomy-wise, is to uh, find a bunch of pulsars at different distances from the Earth and in different directions, and we know their periods really well. Uh, so as a gravitational wave of low frequency moves through the neighborhood, it perturbs those periods in a way that allows us to re reconstruct the waveform. And uh, actually, the pulsar timing array results are now putting upper limits on the uh, number of supermassive black hole mergers that exist. In the next 10 years, that should be an upper limit that starts to be observed or probable with the kind of sample sizes we're looking for. Uh, so there's interest in this. This is a relevant thing to do. It also, of course, how many supermassive black hole binaries there actually are will tell us whether we're right about this hierarchical buildup kind of thing, or about the occupation fraction of black holes in galaxies, which is relevant to the very next project. So um, you might have heard there is some trouble uh, in uh, black hole theory, because we don't know what the seeds of supermassive black holes are. So if we look at high redshifts, we actually see supermassive black holes troublingly close to the Big Bang. Um, you know, redshifts of six or seven. And that's troubling because it's hard to create a model in which something grows to be 10 to the nine solar masses in that short of a time. Um, and there's two major uh, candidates for this. This is not my specific field of, of I don't do theoretical cosmology, but um, the, uh, the depths of massive stars, so these are huge stars, much bigger than the stars we have today, hundreds of solar masses, uh, that directly collapse into supermassive, or that, that die in, in the usual way that the stellar lifetime would be ridiculously short, uh, and then produce a supermassive black hole seeds, which then grow by merging, or direct collapse, where this huge gas cloud just goes all the way down. Uh, and that's the difference is uh, most of the halos, uh, dark matter halos, are seeded in this model, and the seeds are 100 solar masses. In the other model, few halos are seeded because this collapse is rare. But the seeds are much larger, 10 to the 4. Uh, but the upshot of the plot here is the bottom panel, which is that the observational consequences of each of these models uh, predicts a different occupation fraction, or how many galaxies have a black hole, uh, for dwarf galaxies, for low mass galaxies. So this model predicts that all dwarf galaxies should have supermassive black holes. And this model predicts that about 60% of them should. Um, so, uh, the occupation fractions of black holes in dwarf galaxies can tell us about the possible seed mechanisms for supermassive black holes. So how do we find AGN in dwarf galaxies? Turns out it's actually kind of tough, because if the scaling relations hold, these are kind of puny black holes. 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 5 solar masses, maybe even 1,000. So, uh, so it's hard to find them because their emission would be very weak. Uh, we, we might not be able to detect it in the x-rays. People have done deep surveys in dwarf galaxies and found an AGN in the x-rays, but again, that's, that's very time consuming and you might be looking where you might expect to find one. So, uh, work by Vivian Balasar 
uh, another Einstein fellow who showed this plot out of the uh, symposium, uh, is looking for AGN by variability. So she's using ground-based data in Stripe 82, which is a part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey where they've done a whole bunch of different surveys. Um, so they have a whole bunch of different data points. And she is looking at dwarf galaxies with less than 10 to the 10 stellar ma uh, solar masses, um, uh, galaxy mass, not uh, black hole mass. Um, and looking for uh, variability that matches patterns that we see in AGN variability. So she found a lot of like spikes that look like supernovae and stuff like that, but she has a model uh, and is looking for AGN variability. And her work has indicated that it's possible that there's a lower occupation fraction of galaxies and dwarf, or of, of black holes and dwarf galaxies. And that would mean that we're leaning towards the direct collapse model. Um, so this is very preliminary stuff. It's uh, difficult to do because you can see the sampling is not great. The modeling is difficult. Um, the tests, or the, the Kepler sample was very small, uh, but there was another Kepler sample uh, of galaxies that was much bigger. So this was the Kepler supernova experiment. Uh, what they did was they wanted to watch supernovae explode. Usually we have to wait till the supernova goes off, and then we swing everything around and look at it. Uh, but what they wanted to catch was the pre-explosion light curve coming up to the explosion. So how to do it? They uh, gave Kepler a sample of 400 galaxies, just plain galaxies, not AGM. Uh, and they just decided, like, okay, if we look at these for long enough, one of them is going to have a supernova. And they were right. Four of them did. Uh, so that's great. The supernova light curves are beautiful. And they got all kinds of cool shock breakout candidate stuff going on there. Uh, but they also just have these long light curves of 400 galaxies uh, that didn't do very much at all. So a group uh, led by Ed Shia was looking for variability in these galaxies to see if there were any AGN there. Uh, so he actually, if these are Kepler light curves, he managed to find uh, variability signals in, uh, I think it was 15 out of 400 uh, that were candidates. And then I went to the DCT telescope at Lowell and took deep spectra and found broad emission lines in three of them. Uh, so, okay, like my, maybe this is a good way to go about this. And the precision of Kepler and TESS, uh, and TESS, of course, will be able to do it for most of the sky, uh, will really give us a better way to do what Vivian's trying to do with Stripe 82. And she's going to do it, but, <laughs> um, and uh, look for this signal uh, in much more galaxies and with much higher precision than you can do from the ground. So, hopefully, we'll get a good occupation fraction results from that. Uh, now, let me go on what will look like a diversion, but will be brought back at the end uh, to talk briefly about um, how AGN jets affect galaxy evolution. So you're probably familiar with the scheme. We think galaxies start out as blue and star forming, and then something causes them to transition to these big red and dead galaxies. Um, this is a nice plot <clears throat> from the Galaxy Zoo stuff uh, that shows that. There's the color. This is the blue cloud over here of the star forming guys the red and dead guys, and if you put AGN on the plot, which are the colored points, they tend to lie in what people call the green valley, or in the middle, uh, in between. Um, and the histogram shows this pretty well. There's the distribution of normal galaxies in the AGN. There is some controversy about whether this is a selection effect or not, uh, but taking it for what it is, uh, people have interpreted this for a long time to mean that an AGN must do something to the galaxy that shuts the star formation off. How does it do it? Um, there's a few different ideas, but two of them are very prominent. Now, this is a simulation, and you're going to have to zoom out because we're no longer talking about the accretion disk. This is actually the galaxy disk and then the AGN jet. So we're way zoomed out now. The color is density, so the disk is cold and chilling out, has lots of molecular gas, and the AGN outflow is very hot and energetic. Um, <clears throat> two things can happen here. The, uh, the jet can kick the gas out. It can entrain the gas with it and take it out of the galaxy, so that's not forming any more stars because it's gone. Or it can inject a bunch of thermal energy into the gas and heat it such that the giant molecular clouds cannot cool and collapse and form stars anymore. So there's two good ideas for how this AGN feedback, as we call it, uh, might be able to regulate star formation in the host. Uh, okay, so in order to study uh, whether this happens and what's happening to the star formation, um, I, I did something a little different. So uh, I am a time domain astronomer, but I actually, I was going to say moonlight, but I guess it's more like daylight as a radio astronomer uh, because of some issues that happened to it. So Kepler, um, Kepler actually 
something bad happened in one of his reaction reels in 2013 in the middle of my thesis, and uh, it turned out another grad student had quit recently, and there was an AGN project with radio observations of star formation that was just sitting around with no one to do it, so I started doing that. Um, and uh, so I still do that, and so in order to see whether star formation was different in these AGN that might be turning off uh, and galaxies that are not AGN, we did a radio survey. Uh, and in that radio survey, uh, we found uh, these jets. So we found star formation, we did, we saw star formation maps, very cute, uh, but we also saw these, these interesting jets. Now I don't have a size scale on this picture, but I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, this is the Bat Asian Radio Survey, or BARS, um, and we did find some interesting star formation stuff that I don't have time to get into, but I will show you just one really cool uh, plot. This is the, uh, a plot of the global star formation rate in a galaxy, in solar masses per year, solar masses per year, versus the total stellar mass of that galaxy. And the gray dots are not AGN, they're normal galaxies, and this kind of region I'm showing here is called the main sequence of star formation. So it makes sense. There's a relationship between the rate stars are forming and the mass of the galaxy. More stars, more, more stellar mass. Um, and if you put the bars AGN on this plot and you give them different colors for the radio morphology, so we have objects that were compact and unresolved, uh, that's the black ones. Objects that are uh, star formation, that's the blue ones. But focus on the red and orange ones, which are the ones that have these jets. So these red and orange jets, uh, these, these objects with these jets, they have star formation that's below. <clears throat> the, the star formation rate they should have according to the main sequence. So this might be evidence that these are actually these jets are actually causing the feedback I showed you earlier and suppressing the star formation. And you're like, okay, that makes sense. You just explained why that can happen. But a little more surprising uh, is when I show you these jets on in their galaxies. So the pink contours are now the jets I just showed you. This is one of them. That's one of them. Uh, with the exception of the guy in the le uh, top left, who's kind of special, and we have a, a dedicated project for him, um, these are kind of weeny <laughs> uh, jets to be turning off the star formation in the whole host galaxy. So I'm working now on the energetics of this, the energy budget, to see if these jets are capable of it. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a kind of a side thing that's going on there with galaxy evolution. But these jets, as we talked about before, <clears throat> might potentially be generated uh, due to interactions with the disk, so the accretion disk. Now there's a whole lot of theoretical ideas about why some AGN have jets and some don't. Uh, most of them involve what kind of geometry or situation is necessary in the central engine to collimate a jet and launch it. There's a ton of models. I'm just going to talk about two. Um, the first one over here is that you have a magnetic field that's anchored in the accretion disk. The accretion disk is spinning. So as it spins, it twists that magnetic field into this helical structure, which allows the plasma to be collimated, the magnetized plasma to be collimated within it. Um, you can imagine that uh, in order to have that happen, the disk would have to be well-ordered and stable and have a magnetic field threaded through it and rotating, uh, differentially rotating. Another idea is that uh, the collimation comes from geometry. So this is, a, again, another side cut with the accretion disk in blue. Um, but at low accretion rates, if you model something with very low accretion rates, uh, the inner disk kind of puffs into this fat little donut that goes around the black hole. Um, and the jet may be collimated by geometry, by the, the actual accretion flow that's blocking it from spreading out. Um, the theoretical details are not super important here except to recognize that uh, different accretion flow shapes might give rise to different bulk variability properties because the variability comes from the disk. If the disk is donut-y, it might have a different uh, variability than a stable disk that's magnetized. So the fact that we have a large uh, radio survey that can look for all these different jets and then the test variability means we can look for differences in the bulk variability properties between jetted objects and non-jetted objects. And this can be expanded too to radio wow jets and the quasars and things like that. So. Uh, that's just a <clears throat> sampling of some of the stuff I want to do moving forward with tests. Um, these instruments are broadly applicable to a lot of high energy applications, um, like I mentioned supernovae, uh, X-ray binaries, cataclysmic variables, um, lots of accreting systems, uh, even young stellar objects and things like that. So uh, I, part of what I do is evangelize for the use of these instruments. Um, the test deadline cycle two was extended because of the shutdown, so there's time. And, uh, 
And it's, the data, uh, I should say, with tests are um, public, and uh, you don't have to write a proposal to get them. So they are being released now in incremental uh, process. So if you are interested in that, let me know, and I'm happy to uh, help you uh, get your head around those data. And, and with that, I thank you for your attention and take the questions. was that there may be 2,000 on each pole that are bright enough to do photometry with tests. Um, and then we'll have a year baseline, so that should be fine. The, the, the longest characteristic time scale we had was 51 days. It's dicey in a year, just because you like to have 10 cycles, but it's, it's okay. Um, and that was for a 10 to the 8.9 solar mass black hole. So for the moderate ones, we'll have enough. The wedges of tests, where it starts to be the overlapping wedges, they can get to the 27 days is we can't use it for characteristic time scales, the, ma the main baseline for tests, because it's too short. But the wedges go like it's, it's a full year, 180, 120, and like 80 days. So um, as you go into those wedges, you'll get the smaller mass black holes. Um, but as long as you are careful about your population statistics, then it shouldn't be too biased. But um, but yeah, it's a good point. It won't be. You won't be millions. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, some people have tried to do this, like with optical light curves on the ground, um, very early, like I don't know, maybe like ten years ago, or fifteen years ago. And so people have claimed that there is, you know, this. And the thing is, because the sampling is not great, they're using like structure functions yes. instead of the power structure. So, so yes, yeah. it's all been very fuzzy, but there have been. But yeah, so Wool, I think Wool in 2007 was the first people that found a correlation between mass and characteristic time scale. But yeah, it's, it's like they have to bend their data yeah, points in like yeah, huge bits. Very... And of course, the, the goal would be to have an observable that correlates with mass in such a way that we could measure masses with it. Right. right, um, right. Now, I think, so the, what I'm working on sort of phenomenologically is I don't think that's going to happen even with the Kepler data because I don't think, or with the test data, because I don't think we understand which component of the optical variability is dominated by the mass term. So um, I think X-ray reprocessing is part of the optical variability. Um, I think mass accretion rate fluctuations and also magnetic reconnections and flares and turbulence. So I think it's possible to do it, but it's not going to be as simple as it is in the X-rays. Um, so I think there's going to be some teasing apart of the variability to understand it, and that's why there's such huge scatter, in addition to the reasons you say that there's error from the ground. <clears throat> yeah, I was curious, in any of the monitoring campaigns, do you get any uh, more than one band pass? So for something like lensing, of course, that would be gold. Cause yeah, be so that is a drawback of TESS and Kepler both, is that monolithic bucket, you know, they don't care what wavelength the star's at, they just want to see if it's periodic. Um, yes, uh, so the, that would be a role that would be very important for ground-based exactly. simultaneous right. stuff. Um, PTF has two colors, so that was, uh, I, you know, that's not a lot. It would tell us whether a flare was moving out or in, basically, but other than that, not really. But like you say, for lensing, that would be fa fabulous, would be to see uh, the lens proceed across <clears throat> the accretion disk. Uh, so um, it's possible that PanSTARS will do some of this with us. Um, there's the SMARTS campaign with, at Yale that does multi-wavelength ground-based monitoring. Um, so the test data, fortunately right now, there's all kinds of surveys going on and on and on. Um, but yeah, having colors would be ideal. The test data and Kepler data simply don't do it. You don't have real-time detection Right, you, right. Have you have to wait. Yeah. yeah, you have to wait. They, they don't. It's not a, a transient detector, so they 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 send the light curves down much later. And even the spacecraft sends the light curve, the data down later, because uh, it doesn't turn and point at us very often. So, um, so yeah, you don't. You can't trigger basically. For the for the binary black hole lensing, where you have the, the, the two peaks and you have the predicted peak, uh, is there? Um, just looking at the baseline, is there uh, independent evidence you have that the peak you saw wasn't the second peak? 
Oh yeah, that's, that's a good point. Been unobserved. That's a good point. Um, the only evidence for that is that it would be unusual for a 10% variation because that would mean the larger peak was a lot more. Um, but no, we don't. And in fact, uh, it should be possible with some ground-based surveys to go back and look and see if there was anything before. Um, and I think the reason Dan modeled it that way is probably just because it looks like it's at the early point of the sinusoid, which is what his model showed the first peak would be. But that object is kind of flat before that. So one thing that's possibly happening there is that the galaxy starlight is has a floor at a certain level and then it, the sinusoid just runs into it at some point. Um, so we don't know yet. Um, but it was recently suggested that I look back at Catalina and some of the ground-based surveys to see in the past if this flare has happened at some other time. So it could be the secondary flare, I suppose. And then what is the, the width of that, of the sharp? You mean the length sure. the, in time? Ah. Uh, it's about three weeks okay. de decay. And the profile doesn't look like a TDE. It doesn't look like, it only looked like an extreme mass ratio in spiral. That's the only thing that it remotely fit that decay curve. And the decay curve is kind of jagged, so. Uh, did your strategy for dealing with elongated sources change much when you went from Kepler data to test data since tests are yeah, it's a lot harder um, <laughs> because the strategy used to be to make a really big aperture and let the galaxy dance around inside of it. With tests, you can't draw a big aperture because any aperture you draw includes a whole bunch of other guys. You know, even the pixel has more than one galaxy. So there's no way to draw a big aperture. The answer to that looks like it's probably going to be difference imaging. Um, but I haven't gotten to play with that tool enough yet. But yeah, it is going to be a different strategy. How many Fermi variable sources are in the test field? Yeah, uh, so in the whole test field, there's many dozens, but in the... Variable sources, Fermi variable sources. Fermi variable sources, mm, 12, yeah. one dozen. Um, and then I, there are three, at, so there's, I'm doing four blazars at the, uh, around each pole that were bright enough in Swift, in x-rays for Swift and reasonable data points, and bright enough for tests. So those are the ones that are in the program. Okay. For your uh, dwarf galaxies where you find the black holes, you said I think that there are four that you expect to have to be From so Kepler, yeah. Okay. So was that, I guess probably H alpha uh, beta. But we, but we saw the broad lines in H alpha, but it, I had to confirm it in H beta. But yes. So how long were those exposures? Like how how faint were these? Uh, so this was a four meter class telescope, and the oh they're faint. So they're like seventeen. Magnitude, 18.2, so half an hour, 45 minute exposure on DCT.